Thanks, uh, Juan, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, epidemic threats have uh, been part of the human condition of history. And, uh, you know, headlines more recently, uh, Ebola, of course, uh, Zika. Uh, we should think of influenza, and we should definitely think of something that uh, uh, Dame Sally Davis, who's here with us, has been really pioneering. I mean, and that is uh, getting serious about dealing with antimicrobial resistance. These are all epidemics, by definition. Um, but uh, uh, I've spoken about Ebola here, and, uh, uh, but uh, this time I'm going to speak about what I think is becoming a forgotten epidemic and illustrates how an epidemic can become what we call endemic. In other words, that you don't see a continuous increase in uh, the number of people infected or living with a particular uh, pathogen, microbe, but where um, it has been really embedded now in, um, in society all over. And when you look at the last um, 100 years, more or less, um, there have been two mega epidemics. Um, just at the end of World War I, and killing more people than in the whole of the uh, World War I, and that's the Spanish flu. That's the big one. In California, when we talk about the big one, it's the big earthquake that one day will come and will wipe out even Silicon Valley, since you're into IT um, and innovation. But in, um, you know, for us, uh, the big one will be a mega epidemic of um, the kind that we had with the Spanish flu, respiratory virus, probably some no new type of uh, influenza virus, and, um, and we need to be prepared for that. In the meantime, when you look at this, uh, you know, the various epidemics that we've had, small and big ones, um, HIV has been the, the biggest one, and it's not over yet. Um, cumulatively, over 30 million people have died. What started uh, as a case report of um, uh, what was eight or nine uh, gay men in California uh, dying from an um, unknown, a mysterious type of pneumonia um, has turned now cumulatively uh, into an epidemic that now has affected about 70 million people. All these people are connected with each other. They had sex with each other, uh, the mother had it, so transmission from mother to child, sharing needles, had a blood transfusion. It tells you a story about, you know, how we are connected to each other and about underground networks that we really need to understand in order to fight epidemics also. It gives you a new uh, idea of what blood brothers mean. Um, now, AIDS is not over. I mean, when you look at this uh, grave tomb here, uh, it suggests that in 1981 we had, uh, you know, it was over. No, it continues. And, um, and it is, um, as I mentioned, it's really a forgotten epidemic. Uh, when I talk about it, then people say, oh, isn't that over? We've got drugs, no, and it's fine. Uh, and that's absolutely not the case. Now, how do I move the next now here? Um, so I would like to make a few points and what showing that uh, AIDS is not over. First of all, the good news is we've made fantastic progress, great achievements, but I can't call it a success story. <coughs> and when you look here just for sub-Saharan Africa, which is the part of the world that is most affected, but I should remind you that in London, every single day someone becomes infected with uh, HIV, um, we have uh, a major decline in new infections that started already uh, in the late 90s, thanks to prevention programs, we have a major decline in deaths, 50% since uh, in the last uh, 13 <coughs> years. Um, and uh, that's thanks to a major increase in, the, in access to antiretroviral therapy, which was discovered in 1996. And all this was possible thanks to a m worldwide mobilization. It was um, after the discovery that AIDS is a treatable condition, that uh, particularly people living with HIV literally fought for their lives uh, by activism, putting AIDS on the political agenda, and, and so on. So it was really the, the driver of all this, these uh, achievements was uh, activism in the first place, combined with innovation. Innovation in new tools, I mean new drugs, but also innovation in um, dealing with communities, engaging people, uh, just not only have the doctors deal with it, but also people living with HIV. 
And that was uh, thanks to this um, really game changer um, anti uh, antiretroviral uh, therapy. Now, it's not a cure. We shouldn't forget that. And I'd like to remind everybody that it's not without its problems. Um, in the first place, in the early days, it was the price. It cost about 14,000 US dollars per person per year to treat someone with AIDS. And that was way beyond the budgets that um, most people in the world can afford, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And so thanks to a combination of, let's say, diplomacy um, and um, activism, um, and then the appearance on the world market of um, Indian generic uh, manufacturers uh, that we saw a major decline in price. These are the prices for antiretrovirals in Uganda. In five years' time, it came down from 12,000 to about um, 200 uh, US dollars per person per year. That's a breakthrough. But it's not enough to have something at low cost. You also need someone to pay for it. And that's where uh, specific mechanisms were set up to fund it, and that was uh, the Global Fund to fight HTB malaria, which did a great job. And then also, um, uh, in 2003, President uh, Bush took everybody by surprise by asking US Congress for $15, $15 billion to deal with AIDS. And that, uh, you know, that then cr led to the creation of PEPFAR. Um, now, as I said, it's not a, um, you know, a cure. There are um, major side effects of long-term uh, therapy. Um, people who have been on treatment now for 10 years, 20 years, have a kind of normal life expectancy, but have lots of problems. And there is the um, looming um, you know, drug resistance that, are, that is probably going to happen. So it is not uh, just a, um, an easy uh, condition to treat. We also know that there is no magic bullet. Unlike um, some other infections where you can just say, we have a vaccine, we, we do this, we do that, and that's fixed. I'm not going to go into uh, you know, any um, details here, but it's about sex in, the, in most cases, so about sexual behavior, about power relations, about gender. Um, it is about, um, you know, uh, up to about 10 years ago, all we had as technology was the condom. And uh, in the meantime, we have more uh, sophisticated ways, and I'll come back to that, particularly um, you know, using uh, antiretrovirals as for prevention as well. Um, but it is uh, something that uh, requires a society-wide approach. Now, there have been, um, because of all these achievements, um, there was a, you know, the perception, there still is, that it's over. Even UNAIDS and, uh, and the US government and Obama, they predicted that by 2030, AIDS will be over. And I thought, what have they been smoking? <laughs> because this is about, as I said, sex, one of the major drivers in, in the human condition. Um, and it's also about poverty, about power relations and gender and so on. And also by the fact that we still don't have a vaccine. So where are we? First of all, uh, there are still 2 million people every year who become infected with HIV. 2 million. It's enormous. And about 1 million who die despite our uh, great achievements in providing antiretroviral therapy to about 16 million people coming from a few hundred thousand. Um, and, um, and as you can see on this curve, there is hardly any um, decline in new infections uh, over the last uh, you know, 5 to 10 years. So we're a bit stuck. And, and partly that is due to the fact that the whole strategy to deal with AIDS has been on providing therapy. We drop prevention. And also it's easier to provide pills and to say we need to talk about sex. We need sex education. We need to talk about the position of women in society. We need to talk about you know, gay rights and so on. Um, then secondly, uh, when you look at uh, Southern Africa, there, um, you know, we are really in a crisis uh, situation and we should be in a crisis mode and we are not. South Africa itself is 6 million people living with HIV out of a population of about 50 million. But it's particularly girls and young women that are affected. Since this is the second day of International Women's Day, we need to know we should draw attention to that also. Look, this is in rural KwaZulu-Natal, in the northeastern part of, uh, um, of South Africa, where on the average, 9% of women every single year, of young women, 
are becoming infected with HIV. And uh, I won't go into the, the details here, but by the age of 35, half of the women are HIV positive. Can you imagine what that means? And, and that is because these women are infected by men who are a bit older than they are. Uh, it has a lot to do with transactional sex, with violence, with poverty, and so on. So uh, it's not by providing a few drugs, a few pills, that we're going to solve this. So that's a real crisis situation that's all over southern Africa. Then thirdly, when we look into the future, we shouldn't forget that we are um, you know, now entering the largest cohort of young people, of adolescents in human history. And this is a, um, for um, sub-Saharan Africa, first place. And uh, you see that just by the fact that we see this demographic change, we're we are struggling with old age aging and so on. In Southern Africa, it is a, a whole generation of adolescents. By definition, we'll have more people who are at risk. And then fourth point is that closer to us here in Eastern Europe, in the former Soviet Union, there's a crisis <laughs> that is entirely due to the lack of action by politicians, by the refusal to adopt evidence-based practices. It is driven by injecting drug use. We know what to do, needle exchange, uh, you know, methadone treatment and so on. They're refusing and you see what's going on. There are now one million people living with HIV in Russia and Mr. Putin, etc., refuse to do anything about it and, and consider them criminals. Now, in Europe, um, it's largely, uh, it's the, the K population that is the most affected. We see you know, the, the, the social media contributing in that sense, making all kinds of contact easier. However, uh, there's some good news also. When you look here at the UK, and at, uh, particularly at London, um, which had a intractable type, seemingly a number of ca new cases, for the last few years, there's been a decline in new infections. Thanks to increased testing, thanks to the availability of pre-exposure prophylaxis, and, and that's really some good news, although the perception, particularly among gay men, is that AIDS, I never heard of it, I don't know anybody who died from it. So what to do, and then I'll stop. The old style is that we have to, um, you know, is information communication, but we need far more than that. And there is the five points I'd like to make. First of all, AIDS has to be put back on the top agenda. By that I mean political agenda, business agenda, community agenda, we need some rebranding, and, uh, you know, of, of AIDS. Secondly, getting serious about prevention, not just providing pills, but prevention and, and, and have discussions about what is this all about. Thirdly, um, we need money, of course, and uh, here I'm quite uh, concerned. We have the Global Fund to fight AIDS to be malaria, done a fantastic job and had some good replenishment of its fund, but now with growing nationalism, isolationism, and with the US being the main funder, we are really, uh, I'm worried whether uh, the money will stay uh, on. And then fall, we need a vaccine. And lastly, we need to um, really have some supply side innovation. Think who do we want to reach? And this is where social media, young people are coming on. And let me end with a clip. Um, one of the, uh, the best uh, ways of dealing with this, this is the end, um, is uh, a, can I have the video clip, please? Um, not. It's going to uh, show you a clip. It's time to begin sugar. an incredible journey. Femi, <laughs> welcome to Josie. Africa's hottest show is back. Femi! Ah, Bongi, the, the last time I checked you were in Lagos. A journey of discovery. There's everything up. It gets lit on a Friday. To a city that never sleeps. Fun! You can have fun here. I've got to release some tension now and then. MTV Sugar is back. Have you even seen my work? Hot? Hot rubbish? Yeah, how would you even know? And when are you just running after him like a lovesick puppy? MTV Sugar, down south. Don't mess with me. You're in Joburg now. So this is a soap opera that's very popular in Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa. 
and was shown in an evaluation by the World Bank that when people who watch this, that they have less HIV, less chlamydial infections, and, and less beating of their wives. It's the first time that a social media campaign was shown to have that kind of impact. That's the kind of innovation we need. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Professor Payet. Thank you.